I don't know that much about the people who invited me here, the Zeitgeist movement, but I know they're for something called a resource-based economy. In other words, the question is, can we imagine an economy which is not based on centralized planning and not on the market mechanism? Would that be possible? And I want to make a bit of a talk about a possible way to imagine a transition uh, to a post-market uh, economy and how that would work. Um, historically, there have been two failed attempts to create a resource-based economy. As most of you probably know, the internet was not invented in the United States, it was invented by the Russians 10, 15 years before. Uh, and there is a marvelous book about it, it's called Red Plenty. Um, basically, the Russians, the Soviets had uh, centralized planning, a lot of bureaucratic problems, and it didn't work very well, and so they tried to make an internet for the coordination of the economy. Uh, but unfortunately, the Russians, the Soviets, discovered that uh, this internet wasn't compatible with the bureaucracy, and they pulled the plug. They actually destroyed, destroyed it, which was, in fact, also the death, uh, the suicide of the Soviet system. The second time it was tried was not far from here. It was in Chile in 1973, and the project was called CyberSyn. And I don't know if you remember this, you're too young, most of you, but I was 15 uh, at that time. Um, so the truckers, which were owners, they were not the workers, they were the owners of the trucking companies, uh, went on strike against the, the Allende government. And Allende called, somebody called Stafford Beer, who was one of the founders of complexity theory uh, and something called viable system models. And he developed for Allende a system of mutual coordination of production and transportation, which is called CyberSyn. That was in 1973. This project actually worked with only 25% of the transportation, mostly fire brigade trucks, ambulances. Allende was able to have the same amount of transportation of goods using this system of cybernetic coordination without computers, just using Telex. What happened there was that Pinochet, when he did the military coup, he sent his planes to bombard, not first the presidential palace, but first the cyber scene center. So it was physically destroyed. Now the third time this will be attempted is actually here in Ecuador with the Flock Project. But don't tell the government because they don't know, they don't know this yet. Um, so now I want to go into a proposal of how we could have a system of mutual coordination for production of goods and services and how this can work. Now it's important to realize that we already have today a resource-based economy for immaterial production, for the production of immaterial goods. We already have resource-based economy. And this is the economy of free software, open design, and open hardware, where you have a community of contributors, paid or not paid, which through self-allocation, their skills and energy, decide to contribute to a common pool of knowledge, software, or design. Um, in the United States, there's a study called the Fair Use Economy, which calculates the economy that's built around open knowledge to be one-sixth of GDP, 70 million workers. So these are workers who get paid in the market, mostly, but they're the work that they do is based on access to open knowledge, which is produced through this system of self-allocation. Um, so this economy has three parts. The first is the community of contributors. The second is that because these communities are working on the same object, creating a universal encyclopedia, creating an alternative operating system, creating the Arduino motherboard, they have strong communities and they created their own democratic organizations which enable and empower the infrastructure of cooperation. These are called the FLOSS foundations. So you have the Apache Foundation, the GNOME Foundation, the Pearl Foundation, the Wikimedia Foundation, the Bitcoin Foundation, etc., etc. This well, is the second part of the, the... The third part of this system is what we call the entrepreneurial coalition. All the market entities which create value on top of the common pool. For example, IBM, very big multinational, today is essentially a Linux consulting company. 
here's the paradox. We have a very strong immaterial production, but which is serving the current capitalist economy. So to make this a bit, I hope, more simple, you have a circulation of the common, open input, participatory process, commons-oriented output. And next to it, we have the circulation of capital. And the paradox is that we don't have self-reproduction in the sphere of the commons, because if we want to make a living, we have to find a job in the sphere of capital. This is the essential problem today. So I think with two or three hacks, we can solve this issue. Because here is the paradox. The license that we use in free software are communistic licenses. And this is the paradox. The more communistic the license, the more capitalistic the practice, because you allow multinationals to use the open knowledge without, uh, without reciprocity. So the first hack I propose is to use commons-based reciprocity licenses. So imagine you're a traditional community in Ecuador and you have traditional knowledge. If you would use the general public license and you would put your knowledge in that license, then anybody in the world could use it, which is fine for me. Pharmaceutical companies would use this and become very rich. But you have no guarantee as a traditional community that anything would actually flow back in terms of livelihood for all the knowledge that you've been building and protecting for thousands of years. But if you would use a reciprocity-based license, you would say, anybody can use the knowledge that we have on the condition that you give something back to the commons. So if you're a multinational and you just take the knowledge, you don't give anything back, then you, be, you would be required to give something back. For example, income. So this is the first hack we would have a peer production license requiring reciprocity. The second hack is, why do you need to work for a for-profit for for company? Why don't you create, as a free software developer, as an open designer, as an open manufacturer, why don't you create your own cooperative enterprise so that the surplus value doesn't go to capital but goes to the workers of the commons directly? So, at the moment you would do this, you would have a community of contributors working with a reciprocity-based license, and around it you would have an entrepreneurial coalition of cooperatives, solidarity economy, social economy entities, which would be the same commoners and peer producers which already contribute to the commons. So, let's assume this, uh, this has happened. So we have very strong commons and very strong ethical economies around, around it, around these commons. Well, the next step, this is the third hack, open book accounting and open supply chains. So, the open software world already works with something we call stigmergy, right? It's a language of the social insects. So if I want to write for Wikipedia, I look and I say, oh, there is no article about the subject that I know, so I can write this article. And if you see there is a mistake, you can change it, that's another signal. So we, have, we already have a huge system of free software, open design, open hardware, which already functions to this stigmergic mutual coordination. And once you have open book accounting, let's say I'm a shoe company, I'm making shoes with an open commons of shoe design. And I can see that my colleagues, using the same commons, and we already connected with the entrepreneurial coalition, they can sell their shoes. Why should I make more shoes, right? So here we have a mechanism for physical production, for mutual coordination of physical production that grows out of commons-based pre-production, organically as an emergent behavior. So in other words, we have the capacity today to move the mutual coordination which already exists for immaterial production to physical production. And I want to say a little word about hierarchy. This is the tragedy of humanity. When we live in small communities, less than 150 people, 
we can operate on trust and friendship and dialogue, etc., etc. The problem is, if I'm bigger than 150, I can beat you. And this is the, the history of civilization. Bigger groups destroy smaller groups. And the bigger groups need hierarchy to coordinate themselves because they can't operate on this peer-to-peer -peer dynamic. They're too big. And this is true for land ownership. This is true for companies. Big beats small in general. So this means if I want to be touchy-feely in my small, in my group, and really have a good life, somebody's going to beat us with a hammer. We can't. We can't do it. But now let's look at Linux and Wikipedia and Wikispeed and the, um, the P2P satellite, which is going to be launched, I think, this year. The average number of people working in a team in Linux is four. The average number of people working on Wikipedia is one. So here we have a system that's already working that can scale small group dynamics on a global scale, making very complex technical civilizational projects. So in other words, we have the potential to move for, to a world, a political economy, a society where peer-to-peer -peer dynamics become the core of the value creation and distribution in the world that is to come. So I conclude with an example about Ecuador of, or how this could potentially work and what the advantage of this would be. Today, you're still a neo-colonial economy. You are exporting bananas, oil, raw material with a small um, profit uh, range. And you import very expensive, high margin consumption and production goods from Western countries. So if you're a small farmer in Ecuador, which I think is the majority of the population. Agribusiness doesn't make machines for you. They make machines which are very expensive and force you to scale. So in other words, if you want to use them, you destroy the, your way of life. But today we have communities like the Nutrient Dense Project, which unites farmers, citizen scientists, and scientists in the whole world to look at nutrients for the soil, non-toxic nutrients for the soil to, to have higher productivity in farming. They are collaborating on a global scale in an open community, creating a common pool of knowledge for farmers. Another type of communities that is emerging very strongly now are communities of farmers and engineers that make open agricultural machines. So we have open source ecology in the United States, we have FarmHack, we have Slow Tools Project, we have Ada Bio Auto Construction in France, which unites the, uh, the, the eco uh, farmers. They're making, designing, comparing their own machinery. And they're building their own micro factories so that they can make them close to, the, to where they need it. Today, if you buy a computer, the cost of transportation is three times the cost of production. So why not make them yourself in a micro factory 3D, 3D printing machines using open global designs? So the rule is very simple. If it's light, it's global. If it's heavy, it's local. So the key problem today of our world is, is actually can be summarized very simply. We believe as a system that the Earth is infinite and we have an infinite growth economy that is destroying our very ecosystem that we need to survive. On the other hand, if you want to find solutions for this, we have patents, copyright laws, we have laws that says, oh no, no, you cannot share. If you don't have the money to buy the patent, you cannot share, it's illegal. So we are creating problems on one hand, and then we say, Oh, but you can't solve them. It's illegal to actually share and collaborate to solve these global problems. So this is like somebody is working on his head. This is the system we have today. A peer-to-peer -to -peer social economy is just the opposite. We have an economy with real localized production, shared infrastructures, take into account the limitations of the environment and natural resources, and we have global communities of people working together to solve social, human,
technical scientific problems. But we still need a country. And I, I will explain you why. And this is my real, real uh, conclusion. Take an example like Wikispeed. Wikispeed is a car that was designed with 80 people during three months with no capital whatsoever. It's a secure, ready-to-drive car which can be built between one and three days in a micro factory using 3D printing machines. And it's five times as fuel efficient as an industrial car. And every week, every week they have a new design for a new car. So every week the car is better than the week before. And so what's the problem? The problem is if you are for profit investors and you don't have intellectual property, this is not interesting for you. Because the profit rate is maybe 5% or 3%, but not 15% or more. So this is today something holding back the evolution of this new mode of production, is capital doesn't invest in these new methods. Because the, the, the money today doesn't come from production, it comes from intellectual rent, it comes from IP. And this is why we need a progressive government somewhere that actually says, we're going to do this. For example, you can have an open science lab with all the scientific instruments for 10% of the investment as a scientific lab with proprietary scientific instruments. The same functionalities. This has been calculated by George Pierce in a book called Open Source Lab. He has systematized the transition from a proprietary open science lab to a open to an open science lab. So on average, the machines from the open hardware communities are one eighth of the cost of proprietary machines. If you want an open source drone to watch the police, it's one percent of the cost of a military drone with the same characteristics. So I want to see a city, a region in Ecuador saying, I'm going to have open source buses with clean energy, clean motors, at one-eighth of the price of the ugly diesel fuming buses that you're using now. And that will be made in the same city in a micro factory by I people who have work here in Ecuador making things that are useful for Ecuador. And at the same time, because you're not selfish people, you share these improvements with people in Bhutan, in Nepal, in South Africa, everywhere. So I'm finished. I just want to say this is a great project, but you know politics, it's full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. So we need you, people from civil society, to show to the government of Ecuador that this is an interesting project that should be supported and that we should advance at least experimentally in this direction.